Hello everybody and welcome to the Red Men TV and your latest episode of Oppo Preview. My name is Dan Club. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by former Brighton defender Adam Virgo for this one. Adam, how do you make you good? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Good man, top man for joining me as well. Really appreciate it. Um, no the slightly, uh, our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Um, the slightly bizarre situation whereby we're doing a joint Oppo preview because it's a double header this week. Liverpool Brighton doesn't come around very often. Obviously, Carabao Cup at the Amex in midweek, followed by the Premier League game at Anfield at the weekend. Um, we'll dive straight into the start of the season, really, from a Brighton point of view. Currently sitting sixth in the Premier League, obviously at this stage of the Carabao Cup as well. Been a really strong start again, mate. Yeah, it's it's been a good start with a with a managerial change over the summer, which you know for for most clubs that can be seen as a, as a hindrance because where do you go from here? But the problem, the good thing with Brighton is is that they've always got a good stability behind the club. Um, so for for Fabian to come in and and take a squad of players that were already doing very very well, and you know Brian have shown their biggest net spend this summer in terms of the players that they've bought in. I mean, there's still a work in progress. Um, I think if you look at it from the outside and you see the points on the boards, you probably think they've had a real solid start. But in terms of their performances, I don't necessarily think the performances have matched the points that are on the board. However, you're certainly going to take that when you when you've brought in a lot of players over the summer. And I'm I'm pretty sure that everyone at the club will be delighted with the start. But you can clearly see it's still a work in progress. Yeah, absolutely. I want to dive into the style and what that change has been really under Hurlitzer. But before we do, just generally on him, I mean, he's 31 years of age, like he's two years younger than I am. Like it's frightening what he's been able to do. But you alluded to it there, really, that Brighton just have this succession plan in place already. They'd have known at some point back end last season that the Zerbi was going to move on. And immediately they find the man, they pinpoint him and they go and get him like... First off, how impressed have you been by him? Not just in terms of the performances on the pitch and the results, but just how he's carried himself, really, in the opening stages of the season. And secondly, just that, the way Brighton's ran, it's it's envious, really, from every club's point of view in the Premier League. Yeah, I mean, it showed that it can be done. I think when you look at clubs in Europe and you look at, say, like Borussia Dortmund or a Porto, you know, clubs do do it in other countries where they sign players and they sell them on for profit. And that's that is a model that, seems to be that people can't do it in the Premier League, but you can do it in the Premier League. Um, listen, he, he's he's a young, young manager, but however, he's been in the game a long, long time. And I think the age may kind of missed a little bit of, of his experience. But, you know, St. Pauli last season, he got them promoted. Now, Brighton do their due diligence very, very well. And, you know, even if you look at the players they've signed over the summer, when you look at the players they sign in general, they're not really household names. They're, they're, they're players that they've gone and researched. There's players that they've gone and watched how they fit into the philosophy. So there's always a good balance. Um, so far, so good. I mean, there will be a time where there will be times where it be, will be difficult and the players that come in don't quite hit the standards that they expected. Um, but I think what he's done, and I think what, you know, maybe what I can say about Arnold Slot is that he's got the culture of the club really, really quickly. And he's understood what, what it means to play for Brighton. He understands the fans very, very quickly. And when you do your first press conference, and I think he came here last season on a visit, you get an early idea of what it's about to be a manager of a club. And and what he's done is continued the work that Roberto De Zerbi did last season. And he said, you know what? I like this and this and this, and I'm going to add this into it. Probably the biggest change that I've seen this season from last season is this high line. Mm -hmm. I think it's the new thing in football now, this high line from a defence. If it was in my day, I think I'd be petrified uh, with the amount of space that's in behind. But it, it, it's the new thing now. I mean, you've got that holding midfielder role that can maybe cover the runs in behind. Um, but that can certainly be an area where Brighton can be got at, but a lot of teams could be got at like that. But I think so far, I mean, you know, his English is really, really good. Um, and I think what also he believes, and I think where the breakdown of communication with Roberto De Zerbi and maybe Tony Bloom and Paul Barber at the top was, I think Roberto wanted a little bit more hands-on with the transfers and a bit more that goes on behind the scenes where Brian have got quite a strict structure of actually, this is the way we do it. These are the results we've got from it. And then if it isn't broken, we're not going to fix it. So I think Fabian's coming in there and of course he's going to have a say in the players that they come in, but there just seems to be a really good balance and a really, really good mix. And, and the results have certainly helped that. No, absolutely. Yeah, it looks like a great, 
selection and manager at this moment in time it absolutely does with a really high ceiling as well and it could be there for a few years if he doesn't get cherry picked by somebody else of course and um, you touched on it there the, the high line and the, the stylistic sort of change I think you're right I think obviously he does fit the philosophy that Brighton have used down the years certainly since they sort of established themselves in the Premier League but one thing I noticed and taking a quick look and having seen a little bit of Brighton and of course looking at the results goals Lots of goals, both for and against Brighton so far this season. 2-2 draw at the weekend, of course. There's a 3-2 recently, a 4-2. There's been another 3-2 recently, another 2-2 recently. Only really one outlier, if you like, of a 1-0 result. I think it was a Newcastle game. But other than that, it's is it enterprising attacking free-flowing football or is it a little bit leaky at the back or is it a mixture of the two? Yeah, I think it's a mixture of the two. I mean, if you see the equalising goal from Wolves on the weekend, which I was covering for the Premier League, Brighton had a four on one in the 92nd minute. Esther Pinha made a run forward that made it a five on one. When then Wolves got the ball forward, they were five on four against Brighton. And you think to yourself, I, I saw the game pre-season against Villarreal and I thought, I, I sat next to a friend of mine who's been a season ticket holder even when I was playing and we looked at each other and I thought, we're going to score a lot of goals, but I'll tell you what, we, we're going to concede a lot because... Yeah, that happens. And I think Newcastle was the first time where I think he changed formation, he changed personnel, and they won the game 1-0. There's nothing wrong with that sometimes. I think that's sometimes coming out of the game a little bit more. 1-0 wins can be significantly massive in terms of away performances, in terms of confidence. You can control the game without the ball sometimes when you defend deep and you frustrate teams. Um, but there, there, there is this element of the balance. And when I spoke about right at the start of the show in terms of Brighton's points don't necessarily match their performances. Mm. I mean, they conceded four and a half against Chelsea. You know, they've they frustratingly given away points against Forest. They've dropped points against Ipswich. Um, Manchester United, they got a late winner on another day. That could have been different. Three second half goals against Tottenham. There's this kind of yin, you know, up and down process at the moment where there's not that quite consistency. And I do think it's the manager trying to put his philosophy in. And I think he's also trying to learn about the league as well, that this is a lot different from the, the Bundesliga and Bundesliga 2 where he came from. So I think there is an element of that, but the, it's almost like you need to learn why you're going along and, and you're going to get these performances where results are going to be very, very up and down. But the balance is, is coming, but the players, new players needed to be bedded in as well. So th there is a mixture, but while all the points are on the board, you can kind of get away with this. If you've got two points after nine games, it's not happening. So for Brighton, it, it's just one of those things where... Things just seem to be going right for them just at this moment. No, absolutely they do, yeah. And I'd like say to have sort of the points tally that you've accrued so far whilst also trying to implement something slightly different and he is trying to get his feet under the table and get his message across, that that speaks volumes of the quality of players that you've got there, that you're able to do that. But also, like I say, bigger picture, hopefully his message does get across and it starts to work a bit more in unison and a bit more balanced and you can keep the back door shut a little bit because that will be alarming just the sheer number of goals that they can see down there. Um, just on the injury front, I had a quick look at the injury list actually and it, it surprised me, if truth be told. James Milner, obviously well known by us, Adam Webster, Matt O'Reilly, Joe Pedro, Adingra, Minter, Solly March and now possibly Lewis Dunk to add to that list as well, Adam. Obviously came off, I think, in the warm-up over the weekend, didn't yeah, actually get yeah. in, involved in the game at all. You, former central defender, Captain, obviously Lewis Dunk, talismanic leader. If he's missing for this double header this week, that would be massively significant, won't it? Yeah, I mean, you, you look at your defence in in Virgil. It's it, they they become key components of the way that the, the the team play, and you know what you bring on the field, but it's also what you bring off the field as well with your leadership and your captaincy. That would have been Lewis Dunk's two hundred fiftieth Premier League um, appearance since Brighton have been promoted. They'd have all been starts, and I think. You know, he's never missed a game. I think that's the first game he's missed um, since Brighton have become a Premier League side. And I think there's five other players that have done it. I think Paul Ince, Des Walker was one I saw in the stat sheet. Um, there's a few more, but I can't remember. But in terms of the importance, and, you know, in that time, he's had Chris Hewton, Graham Potter, Roberto De Zerbi, and now Fabian. All those managers have kind of not built the team around him, but have seen him as a key part that they've not gone in there and thought, you know what, I'm going to stand my mark on the team. He's coming out because there is a vulnerability of his pace, which is obvious, but there's a lot more to his game that that is so, so important. You know, his passing out from the back is really important. Whoever he gets partnered against, I think they, he tends to get the best out of them as well. But it, it is a concern that, you know, those injuries that 
are slowly creeping up. I don't think it's been mentioned to him yet in terms of, is it the training style? Is it what you're expecting of the players? I don't think that's come into question yet, but they've signed a lot of players over the summer and, you know, the squad is a little bit thin, especially with key players. And, you know, Danny Welbeck could have been another one missing, but fortunately he came back and, and got a goal on the weekend. He's a really important player. Um, but I still think there'll be rotation uh, midweek in the Carabao Cup and then probably Brian going back to what would be seen as a full strength side um, on the on the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we wait and see what the sort of the outcome is of Lewis Dunk's problem. There's been no press conferences mm. at the time of recording or anything like that. But yeah, it doesn't bode well. Certainly not for sort of two games in just quick succession this week as well. Um, you alluded to key players there, Adam. Um, Danny Welbeck, I mean, what an Indian summer of a career he's having. He was stretching off a week ago and he's scoring goals at the weekend. Um, I've got to talk about him and also Carlos Belaver. He looks like another find, like unearthed another gem from South America, it feels like, because just how him best have you been a by Danny Welbeck and also by Carlos yeah I mean st starting with Danny I, an amazing stat that he's never got double figures in a Premier League season for goals I, that, I I read that last season when I was covering Brighton on the Europa League and I couldn't believe it and even his age he's 33 now when he signed for Brighton he was 30 and you kind of think he was 33 three years ago um but you, you listen to a lot of people in podcasts and things they, they all they keep saying is if you know if he'd have stayed fit um, he would have been slightly different, but he's really, really important to the way that Brighton play. I would say a bit like a Darwin Nunez, where he's, he's off the ball running and he's off the ball work is so important to the contribution of the side where, you know, but his goal on the weekend was was sheer quite. And if you look at his finishes this season, that's that's an experienced striker that knows where the back of the net is and knows how to finish. And, you know, for a free transfer, which was very unlike Brighton back then to kind of go for those kind of season pros like Milner, like Lalana. Um, he, he's been a revelation and, and speaking to players like Tarek Lamptey off the fields, it's the importance of keeping those players going and keeping them grounded and, and working with them day in, day out. It's invaluable to the squad that that can be just as big as bringing in a recognised talent that doesn't necessarily help with the squad off the field, really. So Danny's Danny's been brilliant. Um, I'm really, really pleased for him. And he's, he's an important integral part for for Brighton, um, for, for Belieber, I, I, I cover French football with, with TNT sports. So I saw him a lot at Lille when he was coming through and the season that he had signed, he only started five games. So it's amazing that Brighton have seen something in him, um, in terms of what he can contribute when he first signed for the club and I was doing local radio, um, interviews, I kind of described him as an N'Golo Kante type of player where he gets around the field so quickly and he breaks up play so, so well. And he's 20 years old. And I think last season he was in and out of the side. He kind of played two games here, one game there, didn't play for three games. And that's never easy when you when you sign for a club and you're trying to implement yourself within the side. But this season he's been Brighton's best player. He, he is different class. And as you alluded to there, the minute these players start playing well, you boys and everyone else around them go right. We'll let, we'll have some of that, and but that's that's the compliment that you give. And but Brian are prepared for that, and I think that's the biggest difference with most clubs when they lose key players that they're not prepared for it. Brian are prepared for it, and they've probably got someone lined up already just in case it happens. They've done it again, ultimately. Yeah, you're absolutely spot on. You, you Brighton have done it again. Because I mentioned it a moment ago, obviously you had Moise Caicedo and Alexis McAllister picked from South America and relative obscurity, if you like. But they just have, you mentioned it earlier on, Adam, just no, not necessarily household names, but you bring them in for, you know, nigh on two, three, four, five million. And then to get sold on for, in Caicedo's case, upwards of 100 million in Alexis yeah. McAllister's case, slightly cheaper. It's just remarkable how they keep, keep unearthing them and keep plucking them out of nowhere it really is and that knack of finding players who go on to be whatever they go on to be when as you say Liverpool, Chelsea sit up and take notice is just yeah it's testament to Brighton's recruitment scouting team absolutely flawless up until this point mm. 